Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Reading Buddy Book Club for July. I hope you guys are having a fantastic summer so far. My name is Miss Emily. I'm an assistant youth and teen librarian here at Fayetteville Public Library, and I'm super excited to be reading our July book with you guys, which is Race to the Bottom of the Sea by Lindsay Eager. Before we start today, I wanted to remind you guys, if you haven't yet, to go ahead and pick up your Reading Buddy Book Club kits, which come with a copy of the book as well as a Reading Buddy. I have my Reading Buddy right here. You will also get a bunch of crafts and coloring pages and a couple of other surprises as well. So make sure that you pick that up at the preschool desk. And without further ado, grab your Reading Buddy grab a snack, get comfy, and let's start Race to the Bottom of the Sea. And don't forget that you can always follow along with me as I read if that's what you prefer. With its astounding monopoly on the Earth's surface, some 80% of blue, and its collection of our most beautiful, bizarre flora and fauna, it's a wonder we don't rename our planet Ocean. Exploring an Underwater Fairy Tale by Dr. and Dr. Quail. Chapter 1. Two scoops of mashed fish guts, four gallons of blood, mix together in a barrel, then pour into the ocean. The recipe in Fidelia Quayle's observation book was for chum, and at 11 years old, she could recite it by heart. This smelly pink slick took to the waves, spreading half a mile in the sea water. Sharks in the bay would take it as the perfect invitation to swim past the research boat, the ancient brown and beige refashioned trawler, appropriately named the platypus. Measure the regulars, tag the newcomers, and hopefully find out which ravenous shark has been munching through entire schools of halibut. Fidelia's favorite days were shark days. A spray of seawater hit her face, rinsing off the homemade sunblock she had just applied to her fair skin and peppering her square-framed glasses with briny speckles. She smeared another layer of the sea slug slime-based mixture over her face, then wiped the lenses on the hem of her pinafore and quickly replaced them. Without her glasses, she was as good as blind. One time, she dropped her glasses during a routine reef check. In the underwater haze, she reached out to find them and accidentally grabbed the snout of an ill-tempered gator fish. Holy hammerhead, she muttered now, catching the sight of the bib in her once white pinafore. It was an abstract masterpiece of pink and brown splotches, faded blood stains, the juice of fish innards, a spot of engine oil, and other fluids from various sea creatures. An entire summer of research displayed in a collage on her clothes. Leaning over the port side, she dumped a sticky scoop of chum into the water. Calling all sharks, I made chum with tuna, your favorite, come and get it. A frozen mackerel stared at her from the inside of an icy cooler. She looped a rope through its gills and threw it overboard as extra incentive. Now the sharks would have hors d'oeuvres and dessert, if only they'd hurry up. Right now, the sky was striped in the fuzzy, lazy blues of late afternoon, but once the undertow hit, all would be gray. Arborly seas, frigid waters teemed with sharks, large and small, during the summer months. Schools of fleshy white cod bred and swarm in the ring around Arborly Island, drawing the hungry predators in. Usually, checking the sharks' tags was easier than milking a sea snake, but today she couldn't tempt the shark with any of the usual bait. Fidelia knew the culprit, the undertow. It always gave the marine life a bit of stage fright. She tapped her hydro scanner. The silver circular radar detector was a Fidelia original. The university didn't have an accurate fish finding device, so Fidelia had built one herself last spring. Fidelia had taken her invention to the patent office on the mainland, but the clerks hadn't even been subtle when they rejected it. A child's contraption, they called it, right to her face. We are not in the business of patenting homemade doodads. This is nothing more than a toy for bored schoolgirls who like to play at science. Play at science. As if Fidelia's whole life were nothing more than a tea party. Ridiculous. She couldn't help being 11 years old, could she? Child or not, her hydro scanner had never missed a fish. 
Its red needle quivered, swept across the screen, and then dropped. Not a fish in the vicinity, not so much as a seahorse. Fidelia gave the hydro scanner a dirty look, then pushed the sleeves of her dove gray frock above her scabby elbows. She moved the macro line to the starboard side and looked down into the water. The chum spun and frothed in the chop, making salty, fish-flavored bubbles. Hurry your gills up, she calls to the sharks, before the undertow hits, she added silently. Hands curled around the platypus's railing, her eyes peeled the surface for any telltale dorsal fins or boils in the water or strange blue shadows, but she was alone until the radio buzzed. Quail, quail, do you copy? Her mom's chipper voice crackled on the speaker. Quail here, Fidelia said. Any sharks in sight? Nothing from our position, her mom answered. Not nothing, her dad said. The mermaid's wine glass is blooming. Steer us a bit closer there, dear. See if you can snag a bouquet to take home. Mermaid's wine glass, a marine plant with delicate green tops shaped like little cups, would be displayed not in a floral vase on the mantel, but in the terrarium on the quail's dining room table. Fidelia's parents were the internationally acclaimed biologist, Dr. and Dr. Quail. They were currently hovering 50 feet below the platypus in a miniature aqua blue research submarine, the Egg, another Fidelia creation. Arthur Quail was a marine botanist, easily excited by the colorful flora of the watery deep, and Ida was a gill fang, and fur-loving marine zoologist. Fidelia, their only loin fruit, was the perfect blend of both, with a knack for inventing that was entirely her own. The platypus rose a wave high, then bounced down with a thwack. How's topside? Fidelia's mother asked. Nothing yet. Oh, wait, stand by. Fidelia tracked the flurry of bubbles through the blood-slicked water. Bubbles could mean sharks but a party of seagulls landed in the water and picked at the chum. Birds wouldn't land if they sensed sharks nearby. False alarm, Fidelia sighed. How close is the storm? Ida Quail asked. Fidelia wiped a smear of sweat from her neck. Oh, we have a while. Luckily, her parents were down in the egg and couldn't see the swirl of black clouds inking the otherwise pastel horizon. Dr. and Dr. Quail would be zooming to the docks if they knew how dark the sky had dimmed. But it was the last day of September, the last day of summer. The last day of tag sharks, their last chance to collect data before the undertow left them stuck on the island for the long, cold winter. Nothing to do except to write up their summer notes and wait for the undertow madness to end. Fidelia wanted to make sure they used every last available second before they were landlocked. Maybe I should put out another mackerel, Fidelia asked, or take the platypus further out to sea. Relax, her father says jovially. Let the chum do its job. Fidelia begrudgingly sat on the platypus's bench and leaned back, stretching her legs. She was shaped like a broomstick, tall and thin, which made for knee cramps and back pain aboard the puny 14-foot trawler. On especially long days like this one, when they left the house before dawn and worked in the bay until supper time, she felt like a sardine in a can. Ten more minutes, her mom said, then we reel everything in. But we haven't tagged a single shark, Fidelia said. We haven't done our final fin count for the university, and we still don't know who's been eating the halibut, Fidelia, her mother said, as tenderly as she could through the radio. We've knocked on their door. All we can do now is wait. Fidelia pulled a wrinkly issue of Adventures in Science Engineering from her bag. I know, she grumbled. Plus, think of all the data we did gather this summer, Ida said. Two new subspecies of red seaweed, the crab migration, the puffin dives, remember? As if Fidelia could forget. All the beautiful things she'd seen in the last three months wove together in a tapestry in her mind the vivid purple of marine ferns in the seabeds of Blue Island, where they spent a blissful three days diving off cliffs into clear water, the scarlet of thorny oyster shells in the eastern lagoons, an unplanned detour on their way back from Kankias, the shocking yellow of a ribbon eel's tail from their week in the tropics, the dusty white of glaciers up north, and the shades of home of Arborley Bay, 
the olive green of the algae covering the rocks on the shore, the soft pink of the stingrays, the dappled brown wings of arborly ducks as they waddled along the decks. Yes, it had been quite the busy summer. If you're worried about our grand renewal, her mother said, don't be. We've had a spectacular year. It's not that, Fidelia said. Dr. and Dr. Quayle's contributions to the scientific community more than guaranteed a long, industrious future of study. The university would approve any funding they required for any project they wanted to undertake. She watched the blue water break white against the boat. It's our last day together, she said, us and them. I just wanted it to be special. I know they're your favorite, her mother said, and even with 50 feet of seawater between them, Fidelia could feel her mother's beaming approval. Yes, sharks were Fidelia's favorite. Their bodies, marvels of evolutionary design. Some the glorious elongated silhouettes with perfectly cut fins and glossed skin. Some the flattened, ornate, ray-like carpets of the seafloor, masters of disguise. Some only the size of a human finger, but with eyes large and dark as blackberries, a variation for every ecosystem. Their grace, the way they cruise through the water, stoic and effortless. Their danger. Sometimes in bed, when the clouds blew over the face of the moon and the light in her room was muted, Fidelia would remember the first time she'd seen a great white shark reach the surface to feed on a sea lion. From the hidden depths came the shark, launching its thousand-pound body up and out of the water in a flash, with the still wriggling sea lion powerless in its jaws. Then it disappeared as quickly as it arrived, the only evidence of the attack a smear of oily blood, crimson against the wake. Fidelia would think of that moment and grin and shiver and pull her bedsheets up over her head, grateful to be a clumsy, clumping land animal. How could sharks not be her favorite? The radio crackled. Come in. Fidelia switched the radio on and off. Come in, Mom and Dad. Do you copy? Hum, hum, click. The egg's reception always got spotty past a sense of 50 feet. Fidelia took her seat and flipped through the Gazette, Adventures of Science Engineering, the premier publication for scientific advancements and inventions. She scanned the pages, advertising helmet veils and hemp ropes. New, 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 boasted an ad. Double-barreled flank tube allows for collection and transport of two species at once. She rolled her eyes. Fidelia had made her own double-barreled flank tube when she was six. The flank tube she was currently experimenting with had multiple interchangeable compartments with space for a dozen samples at a time. Adventures in Science Magazine, the periodical was called, and yet Fidelia was always an adventure ahead. The water was flat, steady, empty. Where were those sharks? She tucked the gazette in her bag and opened her observation book, a simple red leather notebook that went everywhere with her. Her parents had wisely taught her, always be armed with something to write with, and she followed this philosophy like it was law. She uncapped her pen and jotted down, September 30th. First day of autumn storms, last day of shark season. Starting tomorrow, they'll swim to warmer waters until springtime. I won't see them for months. I hate winter. I always miss my sharks. Blue tail, gumbo, prudence, spotty. Even Blit knows the old grouch. The end of summer on Arborly Island meant nautilus shells washing among the pebbles of stony beach. Sea sponges and the cold water reefs turning blue. The arrival of firefly squids in moonlight October in moonlit October evenings. But it also meant the undertow. And of course, the end of summer meant the end of sharks. The sleek sharks left Arborly Sea in big fanged fleets, chasing their last bites of rubbery cod before escaping to the tropics for winter's cold stretch. The final day of shark season was as celebrated in the quail family as any other holiday, albeit a bittersweet one. The end of summer was always a goodbye. This year alone, Fidelia had seen a hundred sharks at least, jumping makos, 
beady-eyed lemons, twitchy blues, matronly nurses scrounging the bay floor for shellfish. They'd even glimpsed a whale shark, that rare leviathan, a gentle giant passing serenely through a red cloud of krill. Eleven years of studying sharks with her parents, and the sight of these creatures still made her gooey. Scared and quiet and fizzing with joy, right under her ribs. In her observation book, she wrote, Some sharks been gobbling all the halibut. The fishermen have complained about holes being chewed through their nets, all their halibut chomped to bones. Our locals here just eat cod and mussels, so we must have an out-of-towner. Mom was hoping we'd get a glimpse of the visitor before the undertow hits, but here it is, the 11th hour, and not a fin in sight. Something burst from the sea depths. A common white surf clam, sent up from the egg. Fidelia reached down with her forever long arms, plucked the clam from the water, and held it in a stream of sunlight. The clam yawned its shell open. Inside, right on its fat pink tongue, was a scroll of paper. Fidelia giggled at the soggy cartoon her father had scribbled, depicting three quails devouring a tureen of soup. Shipwreck stew at the book and bottle for dinner was written beneath the picture. This was the standard quail-to-quail -quail message delivery system, inserting notes into clams, and it was a symbiotic win-win, just like the birds that eat ticks off rhinos or the bees that pollinate flowers. The clam brought the message from sea bottom to surface, and so Fidelia let it photosynthesize the algae that grew on its tongue before she dropped it back into the steely blue fathoms. Fidelia laid the cartoon flat on the railing to dry. Shipwreck stew, yum. Her tummy rumbled. Or was that thunder? If the undertow was close enough to hear, it was definitely time to dock, sharks or no sharks. Platypus to egg, come in. The clouds are growling at us. We better head to shore. Do you copy? She held the radio receiver with one hand and grabbed the mop with the other, cleaning a few splatters of fish blood from the deck of the trawler. The radio fizzled. Fidel, static, click. Platypus, click, click, status. Go ahead and dock her, hum, static, hum. Meet us at the book and bottle, hum, static, click. With a pop, the speaker dissolved into silence. Fidelia turned off the radio. The system probably needed to cool down. Not a problem. She had brought the platypus to harbor alone dozens of times. Shrimp, garlic, cubes of buttery lobster, a few cockles in clear broth with bay leaves and saffron. A nice hot bowl of shipwreck stew would be a fair consolation for her long, fruitless, sharkless day. No, not fruitless. That wouldn't be fair to the hagfish they'd found, tying itself into knots, or to the translucent ghost crabs patrolling the seafloor, or to the kaleidoscope of seaweed clippings Dr. Quail had collected for his samples. But the sharks were the big hitters, and they hadn't bothered to show up. Yes, shipwreck stew to drown her sorrows in, and a couple of baguettes. That's what she needed. Maybe even a trip to her favorite sweet shop, Bon Bon Voyage, for a cocoa blomp and a plum milk float. Hmm, chocolate. More seagulls came. They plopped their ragged feathered selves in the chum and plucked out chunks of rotting fish to gulp down their beaks. Shoo, shoo, Fidelia waved her arms. Get out of here, you sea rats. Two gulls bobbed their heads, peering at her, but she wasn't threatening enough for them to abandon their stolen meal. She went back to mopping. Behind the wall of dark clouds, the sun shifted, pulsing its peachy white rays across the water. The platypus held still. Everything was quiet. Too quiet. The seagulls were beelining it back to the island, leaving ripple rings in the water. Suddenly, the macro line spun out and cast itself at maximum length, the spool of rope smoking with the speed. Fidelia dropped the mop with a clatter. The hydro scanner pinged, red needle bouncing. She glanced at the water and squealed. Shipwreck stew would have to wait. Fish, the hydro scanner announced. Big fish. Shark. Chapter 2. A dark blue shadow cruised along the side of the platypus. The macro line tugged down into the sea, then snapped clean off. 
The triangular fin of a shark sliced through the water. Fidelia reached for her track gaff, a one-motion trigger and release tagging pole that sank tags into even the slipperiest of sharks. She loaded a tag into its chamber and held it over the water. Oh, my sea stars, she whispered. This definitely wasn't one of their regulars. He was 20 feet long, at least. When the creature angled himself with the platypus, his nose jutted out past the propellers. Fidelia's chest bristled, a thousand itty-bitty stingrays swimming and flapping their wings all at once. She had hoped this day would be special. Now it was quickly rivaling the most exciting day of her life. The shark made another rotation around the boat, a jagged scar wrapped around his dorsal fin, a constellation of pink-white tissue. The sight made her burn with rage. She had seen those battle scars on loads of creatures. Cause of injury? Barbed fishing lines. They were illegal here in Arborley, but the law didn't extend to other parts of the world. Greedy industrial fishermen spread these death traps around the tropical seas as if the sharks were monsters, deserving only of slaughter. They were lucky this beast got untangled. He was big enough to take any standard-sized fishing boat down with him, if he was angry enough. He swam back and forth, too far out for Fidelia to nab with the track, with the track gaff. She took her binoculars out of the bag, just a refashioned pair of Ida Quayle's old copper opera glasses, but they gave Fidelia the perfect close-up view. The shark's skin faded from a polished pearly black on top of a dappled gray underbelly. She studied his jawline, his pectoral fins, counting his gills, five of them, standard for sharks in the Lamniform's order. His wide sweeping tail curved like a sickle. This creature was built for speed and power. His teeth were long, thick triangles, so she knew he ate seals and dolphins and other critters with plenty of fat. Hey, she cried suddenly, you're the one who's been eating all the halibut. How many dozens of fish did it take to satisfy a shark this size? No wonder there'd been such a dip in the halibut population this year. Less halibut in the bay had led to an increase in sculpin, halibut's dietary staple, which led to a decrease in seagrass, sculpin dietary staple. Such was the way of the sea, a delicate ecosystem, every pairing of predator and prey carefully balanced. To lose one or the other meant the whole biological orchestra jangled out of tune. Fidelia tapped her chin as she thought. She knew the records of documented sharks backward and forward, knew all 200 species by sight, silhouette, and scientific name. But she'd never read about a shark like this. You are gorgeous, she said to the mystery shark. The question is, what are you exactly? You have mako teeth and a great white's tail, but you're too big to be a hybrid. She pictured the doctor's quail's view, 50 feet beneath the surface, the egg puttering among the clawed reefs, the shark looming above them, ragged teeth poking from his snout like crooked rows of ivory headstones, his creamy belly glowing in the darkness. Fidelia put her binoculars back in her bag and snapped the radio on. Mom, Dad, come in. Are you seeing this? Her hands were shaking. Seeing what? Her mother's reply was calm. We just dipped down to pick some mermaid's wine glass and... Starboard side! Fidelia burst. Quick! All right, we're moving. Arthur Quayle grunted as he cranked the egg's helm. Sometimes salt water gummed the wheel. A quirk of the submarine Fidelia was still working out. The shark busied himself with the mackerel Fidelia had offered, nonchalantly chewing until it was shredded into fleshy ribbons. Do you see him? Fidelia impatiently transmitted. A moment of static, and then, We see him! We see him! Ida Quail was so giddy, the radio couldn't transfer the highest pitches of her squeals. What a monster, Arthur Quail said. A beautiful, beautiful monster. It's him, our halibut thief. It's got to be, Fidelia said. Did you see his teeth? How could we miss them, her father said. They're as big as my good jam knife. So what are we looking at here? A hybrid, or is this just an oversized great white? Trolling the world for spare halibut. Fidelia waited for Ida's expertise, but there was only silence. Mom, are you there? I think... 
Ida said, each word reverent. We're looking at a new species. A new species. Fidelia's goosebumps were the size of mosquito bites. I can't believe it. It's been ages since we found a new species. We? Her mother echoed through the radio. Oh no, no, darling. This is your discovery. The platypus bobbed. Fidelia was stunned, the radio clinched in one hand. But your mother's right, Arthur piped in. You know the rule. He who spots it, gots it. Or she, as the case may be, and that's you. A new species, her own discovery. If she tagged the shark, the track gaff would be splashed on the next cover of Adventure in Science Engineering. She'd patent all her gadgets, and then every wonder in the ocean could be explored with the Fidelia quail invention. Maybe she'd even win a gilded iguana. The shark cut through the water like a razor blade, still too far out to tag, but he was circling closer, getting curious. A gilded iguana, it was the most prestigious award a biologist could win, an honor bestowed only on those who discovered something great, someone who left a mark. Her parents each had one, both of them displayed on the shelf in their parlor, the first things Fidelia saw every morning on her way down to breakfast. If I tag him, I get to name him, she thought, her head light with glee. Ida had an entire collection of mollusks named for her favorite candies. Arthur once thought he was clever when he gave a trumpet-shaped plant its nom de plume, toot weed. Now, at least, it would be Fidelia's turn. The shark rotated again, zipping past the length of the platypus, just a casual swim for a two-ton beast. What should she name him? Carcharanus arborlean? Roughly translated, it meant sharp-toothed arborly shark. No, his official title for the books should use her own name. That way, there would be no doubt that she was the one who discovered him. Lamnidae Fidelius, Fidelius Fish of Prey. She'd pinned down an official name and time. For now, he needed a nickname. The white foam splashed against the shark's mottled, grizzled skin as he cruised around the trawler, mouth gaping, those gargantuan teeth, just bright white blurs in the water. Grizzle. That's what I'll call you, until I can think of something better, she said. Grizzle. The name suited him. He gave her a sharky grin and rolled past, her reflection gleaming in his round black eyes, her pointy features furrowed in concentration. Did you tag him? Ida asked on the radio. Fidelia tightened her grip on the track gaff. Not yet. Not yet, no. But she was ready to sink the tag into his fin ready to make her mark. He's all yours. The radio blared Ida's final supportive words before the whole system dissolved into fuzzy static again. Go get him. All mine. Fidelia set her jaw, squinted past the sun's mirrored rays, and into the water. The platypus leveled in the chop. Grizzle flipped around and barreled toward her. She leaned over, determination flushing through her like a fever. This was her chance. Just a little closer. A burst of wind shook the platypus just as Fidelia clicked. The tag missed the fin and sank into the watery blue. Son of a squid, she exploded, then regrouped with a deep breath. No worries. She had plenty of tags with her. She reloaded her track gaff and waited. Come on, Grizzle. Come on back. Another salty breeze blasted her cheeks like a smack from an open palm. The afternoon's peaceful, sorbet-colored clouds were completely gone. The sky had darkened to charcoal. Seawater swirled around the platypus, tossing it like a bathtub toy. Then someone turned on the rain. Fidelia tried to plant her boots on the slippery deck, but the platypus was just a cradle, violently rocked in the waves. She grasped the railing. The trawler whipped her to and fro like a rag doll. It was here. The undertow was a shift in the ocean's current, a result of the hot summer air leaving the island and colliding with the incoming cold weather front. Its chaos had earned itself a catchphrase. During the undertow, anything can happen. Whirlpools appeared out of nowhere and tore ships to splinters. Schools of cod flopped onto fishing boats, surrendering without a fight. Forests of kelp uprooted themselves from the seafloor and floundered ashore. 
Anything could happen, yes, but the undertow's speciality was destruction. The wind screamed. Grizzle, spooked by the madness, dove down. Wait, Grizzle! Fidelia managed to stay upright, her beam full shadow spearing the last of the shark before he slapped his tail into the stern of the platypus, then disappeared. She hesitated, raindrops freckling her glasses. She should warn her parents that the storm was here, close enough to feel, and she needed to get the platypus into the harbor before the undertow turned it into driftwood, but she hadn't put a tag on Grizzle's fin. It was September 30th. The massive shark would likely be migrating to the tropics tonight with the rest of his fishy cohorts to spend the winter where it was nice and warm. If she didn't tag him now, right now, he might be lost forever, free game for someone else to discover, a lesser scientist, or even worse, just a person, a citizen. She pictured a third gilded iguana on the shelf between her parents' awards. Hers a particularly shiny gold, especially when the sun crept through the garden window and hit the letters on the plaque. Fidelia Aurora Quail, scientist. She had to tag that shark. Even as the storm wailed around her, she opened the cooler and roped another mackerel, her mind whirring at top speed. Should she break out the diving suit? The suit was standard, professionally made diving equipment a canvas suit lined with rubber, which clamped into a 12-volt helmet, and all three quails hated using it. The so-called watertight seal was unreliable. Every other dive, their helmet came up sloshing seawater. Corslets, the piece that connected the helmet to the suit, rusted and broke constantly. And it was the most advanced diving technology available. Inflating the canvas suit took a good 20 minutes, which she didn't have but maybe she could skip the inflation and just head underwater with a saggy suit. If Grizzle wouldn't come up to her, she would swim down to him. She fiddled with the door to the hatch. If only the water eater was ready, she thought. But before she could get the diving helmet and begin improvising, a wave curled over her, tall enough to cast the entire platypus in shade. Here we go, she muttered, and held onto the rail tightly as the water succumbed to gravity and fell. Hair, glasses, dress, stockings, boots, all soaked. Miraculously, the boat managed to stay afloat, but a spray of seawater burst through the slats of the platypus's port side. A leak. Forget the diving suit. The whole boat was about to head underwater. She radioed the egg between tidal wave splashes. No answer, just static. The submarines, for the most part, fared just fine in ocean storms. She wasn't worried about her parents. They would be safe. But, a voice in her mind nagged. They're in a submarine built by an 11-year-old. A child's contraption, the patent office would call it. Again, she called the egg. Again, static. Her parents were probably already on the dock, shivering and worrying and wondering about where their brainy daughter was. She could feel the platypus grow heavier and heavier as it filled with water. Grizzle's tail must have split a hole clear through the wood. Just then, all the bait lines went slack. For a moment, the sea leveled. The waves had blended the chum like a milkshake. Now it sank straight down, the blood diluted, fish guts reduced to pinkish-brown grains. The nibbled mackerel's head floated, a single silver eye staring at the storm. The platypus was leaking, yes, but even worse, Grizzle was gone. Her chance was gone. With blistered hands and a scowl that would startle stonefish, she flipped on the platypus's propellers and prepped the vessel for transport. The back of the trawler dragged below the surface as she flashed to shore, a trail of icy white foam behind her. Her adrenaline dissipated from her body in waves, leaving her exhausted and aching. She hadn't eaten in hours. She'd bring in the boat and get dinner with her parents. She'd regroup, make a new track gaff, in the workshop. Tomorrow morning, if the skies had improved, she'd tar the split boards on the platypus, and together the three quails would sail back out to find the shark, and she'd slip a tag in his fin, her first discovery. She snorted at her own gumption, or at her desperation. Did she really think Grizzle would stick around for the first chill of winter? 
Did she really think the storm would cooperate for one more day of open water field work? But then again, in the undertow, anything can happen. Chapter 3 Fidelia managed to steer the platypus into the harbor just as the engine splittered a briny burp and gave out. She looked for a familiar flash of aqua blue metal near the quail's regular spot on the dock, but the egg was nowhere to be seen. Arborley was a ghost town. Usually, Friday evenings brought a traffic jam of ships, each one impatient to unload its exotic cargo, crate after crate of raw cocoa beans freshly harvested from the tropics. But tonight, the port was dead. Skiffs slumped in their moorings like snoozing dogs. The boardwalk's everyday stench of fried shrimp was a faint memory. No rowdy sailors exchanged tall tales while their crews tied off along the dock. No children poking at the strange things in the tide pools on Stony Beach. No dogs barking joyfully, just to bark. Again, the culprit was the undertow. Only a dimwit would dare stay near the water when it hit. Even now, the black swirling clouds whistled in the bay, gathering steam as they galloped toward the shore. Fidelia quickly tied off the half-sunken platypus, then glanced around the eerily empty port. No sight of her father's pointy black beard. No sound of her mother's happy goose-like laugh. They should be here by now. She ran up onto the bridge. The port narrowed into a canal that flowed through the island as its main road for transportation. The water streamed along the high street, past the shops, past the gabled houses, which all had small white wooden docks in lieu of front porches. Above the mouth of the canal was an arching stone bridge, the highest point in the bay. From here, she could see the entire harbor. No egg. Her heart thumped. The undertow was getting closer. She could hear the growl of its thunder, feel the air around her practically seize up in anticipation of the incoming chaos. They weren't still out on the water, were they? She pulled out her binoculars and scanned everything. The boardwalk, the beach, the Chandler's warehouse, the gate to the shipyard. The sky dimmed even darker. The wind howled even louder. Fidelia wrapped her arms around her thin frame, scooting along the stones of the bridge slowly, carefully, to keep from being blown over. On the boardwalk, rowdy laughter surged from the book and bottle. Fidelia watched the wooden sign flap in the wind, the amber glow of the pub's windows shining like beacons. Maybe she should go inside and wait. Maybe if she ordered three bowls of shipwreck stew, her parents would appear, summoned by shellfish. She opened the door, and the warm air inside the pub sent prickles along her chilled skin. One more look back at the beach, and when she saw nothing, she slipped inside the pub, the wind slamming the door shut behind her. Come on, Mom and Dad, where are you? She thought. Nice hot soup at the book and bottle. If only you'll walk through the door. Every sea dog who came through Arborley Island considered the book and bottle to be a home on dry land. Always a fire burning in the hearth always room for another seat at the bar, always a fiddle or two filling the lulls between conversations, always a better fish story than yours, always, always more ale. Inside, the pub was gritty but cozy. Stale cigarette smoke hung in the air, thick as a curtain. The cedar beams in the ceiling crisped and crossed like the staves of a woven basket. Chandeliers flicked their primitive candlelight providing just enough illumination to see if your mug was empty. Fidelia took a table near the window. The docks might have been deserted, but the book and bottle was busier than a reef during a feeding frenzy. At least two dozen sailors teetered on stools around her, drink in hand. Fernalia! A sailor slurred and shook her hand with his own, sticky from ale. It was Ratface, the whiskered, wind-burned captain of a cocoa ship called the anemone. Join us for a drink. I'm only 11, Fidelia reminded him. Then let's get you some milk, he belched, pounding the counter. Barkeep, some milk for quail and refills all around on me. The pub erupted in cheers. Fidelia ignored the drunken buffoons and took out her observation book. Her hands were desperate to stay busy, 
She loosely sketched an outline of Grizzle's body, huge and barreling, but compact as a bullet as it shot through the water. Five gills or seven? She closed her eyes and pictured the sleek shark. Five. All athletic breeds of shark had five gills, and Grizzle was certainly athletic. Where are Ida and Art? Ratface asks. Out counting the hairs on a walrus's belly? Before Fidelia could respond, a group of sailors crashed into the pub. A woman limped between them, Captain Beagle of the Honey Fox, a gash in her forehead, streaming with blood. Get her a chair, mates, and a clean rag. She's dripping on the hardwood, someone else said. Blimey, Beagle, Ratface guffawed between sips of ale. Did the undertow crack your melon? Captain Beagle let her shipmates plop her down on a stool and drained a whole mug before answering breathlessly. Not the undertow. Pirates. The whole pub seemed to wince. Pirates. Ratface wiped the foam from his top lip and snarled. Those bold bastards. As if the undertow isn't deadly enough. Fidelia sat up taller, her ears alert. Something inside her opened, a chasm of panic deepening. Already, the undertow loomed in the bay, but now pirates within striking distance? Just walk through the door, she bade her parents silently. Hurry, so I know you're safe. Like the sharks that fed on the cod around Arborly, pirates preyed on the cargo ships that sailed to and from port. They pilfered cocoa beans, tropical fruits, and expensive sailing supplies like rope and canvas. Occasionally, they took a whole ship at gunpoint, and the poor sailors were left to drown or swim for shore, if they were lucky, better than being taken captive. Ida Quail had a run-in with pirates once, when she was crossing over from the mainland, returning home after a symposium on marine mammals. The pirates let her go once they realized that the platypus had nothing to steal except empty mermaid purses and red algae specimens. We were heading home after our last run. Captain Beagle flinched as she pressed a cloth full of ice to her forehead. They hit us just before the rain came. They took it all, every last bean. Most of the sailors were too drunk to stir sugar into coffee, but they reacted to every part of the captain's story as if it had been their own captain, their own ship, their own mates. Fidelia only half listened. Through the window, her eyes roved the beach, the docks, the water, over and over, scanning like sonar. Mom and Dad, please, where the devil ray are you? One of their cannons blew through the rigging, sent the boom right into my noggin. Captain Beagle gestured to the wound on her forehead, which was finally beginning to clot. Where are they now? Another sailor frowned, his hand finding the pistol on his belt. Should we sail out and meet them? Give them a warm, arborly welcome? Don't bother, Captain Beagle said. The horizon's blacker than a coal chute. Let the undertow take care of them. It'll eat their ship for dinner, someone else piped in. Fidelia bounced her legs up and down beneath the table, a little nervous soft shoe. The egg's helm was still gummy. Why hadn't she fixed it this morning? How could she be so careless to let her parents take the submarine when there were still so many kinks to work out? All confidence in her machinery drained out of her. Ratface was trying very hard to look at something out the window. His whole face squinted like a raisin. Because of the distance or because of his drunkenness, Fidelia didn't know and didn't care until he said, Say, Quail, isn't that your submersile doohickey out in the water? Fidelia pushed back her chair so fast it tipped over. Where? She scrambled to the window, forehead pressed against the glass. There was the egg, stranded in the shallows of stony beach, waves lapping at the aqua blue metal. Mom, she cried, and everyone in the book and bottle stopped talking. Dad! She bolted out the door, down the boardwalk, and across the bridge. Back outside, the elements seemed to conspire against her. Wind shrieked in her ear. Rain blew sideways, tilting her as she ran. The closer she came, the tighter her guts clenched with the sickening wrongness of it all. The egg, stuck on the shore like a beached whale, porthole window crookedly facing the sky. She crunched over the pebbles of stony beach, the storm throwing sand against her cheeks. When she finally hit the cold water, her breath deserted her. The egg was barely visible as a submarine. 
It was folded in on itself, dented into a twisted metal mess. The aqua paint was scratched away in long lines as if a gruesome creature had dragged its claws across the exterior, or as if the egg had been tossed mercilessly against the rocks and coral of the seabed. Wrenched from its hinges, the hatch door lay useless in the, oncoming, in the incoming tide. The rain fell harder, but she waited closer. The egg's cabin was in shambles. Files were emptied of their contents, which were strewn all over Stony Beach like a soggy paperwork snowstorm. Drips of seawater clung to the keypad of the, com of the command buttons. The dull sound of static still echoed from the radio, the receiver swinging on its wire. Mom, um, Fidelia whispered, trembling. Dad, you there, girl. A constable in a black trench coat and galoshes flashed the orange lights of his patrol boat from the canal. Quail, is that you? What the blazes are you doing? Get inside. My parents, she wailed. Are you mad? The constable said. It's the undertow. Now hustle. No, not until I find my mom and dad. She charged into the water, nostrils flaring, eyes stinging with tears. Her mind jumped from thought to thought like frogs on a lily pad. What happened to the egg? Where were they? Swimming back to shore or being swept farther and farther out to sea? The constable brought his boat out of the canal where the submarine lay. They were in this thing? Didn't they know the storm was coming? Fidelia stood there, cold water biting her calves. It was tagging day. The words barely seeped out of her. Suddenly, her voice was missing, too. She had been the one who insisted they stay out longer than they should have. How close is the storm? Ida had asked, trusting Fidelia's eyes, Fidelia's judgment. And Fidelia had pushed, pushed to the very edge of the storm's mercy. Was this her fault? Black waves reached like hands farther and farther up the shore. The constable pointed at the town. You can't be out here. Fidelia's feet didn't budge. I have to find them. Was she the only one who thought they should be charging into the sea? Under Toby damned? Searching every reef, every ripple? The constable sighed. We'll do everything we can, Quail. There's nothing else for you to do but wait somewhere safe. But Fidelia refused. And finally, the constable motioned for someone to come and forcibly remove her. Another constable, perhaps? Or one of the sailors from the book and bottle? Fidelia never saw whose arms linked under hers, dragging her across the shingle beach to the bridge as she kicked for freedom, shrieking the entire way. The arms placed her on the edge of the bridge, legs dangling over the canal, and left her alone, rain soaking her to the bones. There she sat, Watching more constables surround the egg in the distance like a swarm of flies investigating a bloated carcass. Watched the water rush higher and higher up the beach. She wasn't sure how long she was there. The sounds of the storm drowned everything else out. It was just the rush of the canal and the crash of waves against the rocks and the roar of the undertow. Fidelia? A soft voice somehow cut through the pollution of noise. I'm here to collect you. Ida Quayle's sister, younger by ten years, stood on the bridge under a pale blue umbrella. If Fidelia was a broomstick, Aunt Julia was a feather duster, wispy, somber, with frail-looking limbs. Fidelia had always thought her aunt looked like she'd escaped from an oil painting, too delicate for reality. She, like Fidelia, was bespeckled, but while Fidelia's glasses were square and bold, Aunt Julia's were subtle, round peach frames. Fidelia's throat tightened, mom and dad, but she couldn't say it. If she didn't say it, maybe it wasn't real. A lock of Aunt Julia's hair blew free from its chignon. She caught it and immediately tucked it back into place. Oh, Fidelia, darling. She pulled her knees off the edge of the bridge and into a hug. We have to. Why isn't anyone? Fidelia stammered frantically against Aunt Julia's collarbone. As if in response, a deafening gust of wind pushed across the bridge, nearly strong enough to carry Aunt Julia away. Fidelia sobbed. She wouldn't be convincing anyone to rally a search party. Even the constables were scrambling back to the boardwalk, 
their trench coats blowing behind them like great rubbery wings. Shh, Aunt Julia patted Fidelia's head. Nothing to do now but get out of the storm. Let's go dry off and we'll wait. Wait for what? Fidelia pushed herself free from Aunt Julia's embrace. For Mom and Dad to wash onto shore like horseshoe crabs? Aunt Julia blanched at the image, but Fidelia couldn't bring herself to care. We should be scouring the beach. We should be searching every rock and reef in the bay. Her aunt gently took her elbow and guided her down the bridge and into a waiting canal boat. She slouched onto the back bench while the paddler pushed the boat down the canal. Her teeth chattered. <clears throat> They're okay, she said, mostly to herself. They're marine biologists, right? They're probably fine, aren't they? The words came out in circles, overlapping themselves like ripples in a puddle. Aunt Julia's chin trembled. I suppose anything is possible. Fidelia's mind turned over the details of the situation, hunting for a crack, a burst of light, an answer. Fact. Dr. and Dr. Quayle had last been seen approximately one hour ago in the southeast quadrant of Arborley Bay. Fact. Dr. and Dr. Quayle were navigating the submarine, powered by an electric motor and propellers. Fact. Fidelia had refilled the egg's gas tank this morning. So where were they? Did they escape out the hatch with snorkels? Were they treading water? Were they clinging to the cliffs of the other side of the island? Last year, the quails had published a topographical map of Arborley Island. They'd charted every dip, every ridge, every detail of the seafloor around Arborley Island. But maybe they had missed a cave for their map. Yes, an underwater cave, one of those rare ones that kept a pocket of oxygen beneath the ocean. And the quails could be hiding inside, waiting for someone to track them down and rescue them. But even as Fidelia finished the hypothesis in her mind, the unlikeliness of it, the futility of such thoughts, overwhelmed her, smothering her like a swell at high tide, and her thoughts trickled into silence. So there was truly nothing she could do. Fidelia curled her toes inside her boots. Her fingers squeezed the skin on her forearms. Every part of her clutched to anything available, anything that could ground her, secure her. Tears filled her eyes. As the canal boat floated into the city, the shape of the egg blurred in the distance, an aqua speck on the beach. Her poor crushed submarine, months of work, had gone into its creation, all undone in a single evening. And the other thing she had lost tonight, the last thing Fidelia saw before the canal angled away from the sea, was a twilight wave barreling and sparkling before it was crushed by the darkness of the undertow. Somewhere in the water, Grizzle lurked, untagged, untraceable, lost forever. Two years earlier, when the mother dog sailed, it hadn't just cut through the water, the sea humbly parted itself for the flagship of the Queen's own navy. The 40-gun frigate proudly protected Her Majesty's coast from any crime or tomfoolery. It was top of the line, built from live oak and scrubbed to godliness. The finest vessel in the nine seas. The masts were sanded so smooth, one would think they had never met a storm. Gold writing on the stern spelled its name in flowery script. The commander of its voyages wiped a white-gloved finger along the rail. Not a speck of dust or brine, he gloated. Not on my ship. Admiral Percy J. Bridgewater's head was the shape and color of an oversized beet, with a hay bristle mustache and two tiny rodent eyes that were always roaming, always judging, behind a pair of small round spectacles. Silver piping ran along the seams of all the naval officers' cobalt blue uniforms. Admiral Bridgewater's own silver piping was stretched to capacity around his massive girth. Forty years he had served in the Queen's own navy, and he bore those years proudly. Crow's feet earned in the Second Civil War, frown lines along his jowls from the takeover at Jolly Trow, and the deepest crease in his face, a wrinkle in the center of his forehead, the last ten years had carved that particular beauty into his skin. A full accounting of his records as admiral, right in his flesh. 
The mother dog was finishing its three-week inspection of the cocoa route. So far, two pirate ships had been impeded. The wicked thieves clapped in irons below in the mother dog's dark, drippy hold. The pirates' boodle, sea chest heaping with gold medallions, precious jewels, and pearls, was carefully stashed into the admiral's quarters. All of it would be returned to Her Majesty, after a private accounting by Admiral Bridgewater, of course. A nice clean sweep, Admiral Bridgewater should have been satisfied. Any day when pirates were removed from the bounding main should be a good day, but those weren't the right pirates. The faded green of land finally unfolded across the horizon, and the naval officers exhaled with relief when they thought their commander wasn't looking, but the admiral missed nothing. They would be permitted a week of shore leave, and then it would be back aboard the mother dog for another voyage. Shore leave was the only antidote for the difficult life of a Navy man, a chance to experience hot showers, shoe shines, delicious stove-cooked meals chased by cream-filled desserts, the pleasurable company of a fashionable young lady at the opera. Admiral Bridgewater found no need for it. While his officers gallivanted around the port like half-starved animals, released from their cages, he stayed locked in his office on the flagship, poring over maps and sea charts by flickering lamplight. Soon, he vowed, soon I'll have him. Veer west when we come in range of the harbor, he ordered a lieutenant whose name he didn't know and never would. It's tax day for the Miranda. The Miranda, a tidy little sloop with faded sails, waited at anchor just offshore, placid ripples sparkling blue around its waterline. Admiral Bridgewater sneered at the puny Miranda, at its sea-warped beams, its wrinkled canvas. Its officers angled the mother dog until it was parallel to the lesser vessel, close enough that the admiral could smell the earthy tropical dirt still clinging to the cargo of cocoa beans aboard the sloop. Ahoy, Admiral! The scraggly captain of the Miranda waved his greasy cap. Lovely day we're having, wouldn't you say? The boys were thinking we'd come ashore and find spring blossoms, not autumn leaves. Small talk is for small people, Admiral Bridgewater cut in. Do you have my payments? The captain swallowed. We have most of it, Admiral. Most? The captain held up a bulging jute bag to show the admiral half the usual payment. We'll have the rest to you by the first week of March. March? That's six months from now. A trip to the tropics is a week's sail at most. But the undertow! The captain looked around at his men for backup. It's due to strike any day. Admiral Bridgewater pulled off his white glove and examined his fingernails. Yes, I suppose the weaker seaman of the world can't be expected to brave a little rain and wind. Very well, he said with a sigh. Officer, write down the Miranda now owes us three hundred blue notes. Three hundred, the captain sputtered. But, but that's double the usual amount. A lesson in punctuality, Admiral Bridgewater said. Lest you think I will ever tolerate this again. The captain glowered, but motioned for his boatswain to toss a grapple hook with rope pulleys. It easily caught onto the mother dog's railing. He hung the jute bag of cash on the rope, and the naval officers began hauling over. "'May I remind you,' Admiral Bridgewater said, "'that my royally bestowed task is to catch pirates and bring them to the gallows. Nothing more. Your personal protection in open waters is none of my concern, unless you pay to make it my concern. The jute bag, now dangling above the water between two ships. If you provide half the cost, I can guarantee only half the safety, Admiral Bridgewater continued. The jute bag was nearly at the mother dog, just a few feet away. And pirates, Admiral Bridgewater said, the rotten, blackened souls lurk in every stretch of the nine seas, waiting until your guard is down. The porthole on the Miranda suddenly flew open. A black-haired man poked out of the hole, a lit tallow candle in his hand. Merrick! 
A fleck of spit flew from Admiral Bridgewater's mouth and landed on his impeccably clean railing. I should have known you didn't really hang in San Sebastian. That corpse didn't stink half as bad as yours would have. Behind him, the crew scrambled, preparing the guns. How'd he get in there? The captain of the Miranda cried, his men around him as bewildered as he was. My dear Bilgewater, Merrick saluted from the porthole, the candle's flame illuminating the laughter in his steel blue eyes. Still robbing the good sailors of the cocoa route, are we? And to think, you call me the pirate? Surrender now, you dung-munching varmint, and I'll make sure none of your body parts are left for the krill, Admiral Bridgewater said. Merrick reached for the rope between the ships with one hand studying the jute bag. Admiral Bridgewater narrowed his eyes. You're not a pirate. You're a devil and a dead one at that. Shoot him, he commanded. The mother dog's swivel guns were aimed and fired. Grape shot peppered the side of the Miranda, narrowly missing Merrick, who ducked back into the hole. Hey, the captain of the Miranda shouted. That's my ship. Take it easy. Merrick popped back out the porthole like a gopher and grinned. He lifted his candle higher and higher until the orange flame kissed the rope where the jute bag dangled. Put out that fire, Admiral Bridgewater shrieked. Now I command. The fire danced along the rope until it reached the jute bag, which was not full of money at all, but full of explosives. The noise was terrific. The flash of white light and rich blue smoke was even better. As the string of blasts filled the air, the officers and crew of the mother dog and the sailors on the Miranda threw themselves onto their deck, ears plugged, protecting themselves from the onslaught. Admiral Bridgewater himself dove onto his hot water bottle of his stomach, his nose pressed against the very boards on which his boots had just walked. Bits of debris from the firecrackers nailed him on the head. His rage was now well past the boiling point. Get him, he ordered. Take down the ship if you have to. The naval officers and crewmen staggered to their feet, blinded by the bright flash of the fireworks, and gunners stumbled toward their stations. Admiral Bridgewater watched with his top lip curled, a deck full of flopping foolish minnows, and he the only shark. He'd shoot the pirate himself. Seizing the railing, he pulled himself up, then reloaded a swivel gun and aimed it between Merrick's eyes. But Merrick blew him a kiss and jumped ship, diving into the waves. The admiral's shot hit the railing of the Miranda, sending splinters of wood flying. Blast, Admiral Bridgewater said. The white foam from Merrick's splash dissipated, shifting back to blue. He's got to come up for air sometime, said the lieutenant by way of reassurance. We'll get him then. Admiral Bridgewater waited, squinting at the water with his piggy little eyes, fantasizing about the scoundrel's eventual surrender, emerging from the sea, half-drowned, staring into the endless black tunnels of the mother dog's guns. Any second now. Instead of a soggy pirate gasping for air, an entire ship flew out from behind the Miranda, a sloop of war embodying speed and nimbleness, Merrick the Monstrous's beloved sea craft. If it were an animal, it would be something muscular, compact, a sleek fish, fast and fanged, and it made a lumbering elephant out of the mother dog. Merrick was already climbing a line that dangled from the stern of the ship, reeling himself onto the deck like a marlin, winding its own fishing rod. Admiral Bridgewater could barely get the words out. Get him! Get him now! The mother dog's guns fired, but the lithe sloop of war rode the waves like a bucking stallion, and so the shots sank deep into the ship's boards instead of landing in the pirate's ribcage. The admiral aimed at Merrick's quartermaster, who rolled an eight-pound into the ship cannon and chased it with powder. His shot just missed one of her tattooed forearms, but she chortled and fired back with her flintlock right in front of Admiral Bridgewater's belt buckle. Your aim's gotten worse, old man, she called. Did our little fireworks show leave you cross-eyed, or did you come out of your mother that way? She fired again, and this time her shot would have hit the Admiral square in the forehead if he hadn't lurched sideways. Cannons exploded, 
The mother dog's 12-pound balls crunched the pirate's wooden spars, sending splinters flying. Merrick's crew fired their own cast-iron howitzers and took out the naval ship's mainsail. Surrender, Admiral Bridgewater said. The jewel's no match for the mother dog. Merrick took up the helm, shaking away the excess seawater from his hair. No, Bridgewater, your little peanut brain is no match for mine. The pirate ship cut across the water, making for open sea while the mother dog moved slower than a fat, expectant goose. Fire at will, Admiral Bridgewater screeched. Fire, fire, blast it all, don't let them get away. Gunners reloaded and aimed the cannons, but by the time they fired, it was too late. The pirates were out of range. Get this sorry lumberyard moving. The admiral was absolutely steaming. What are you waiting for? There was a sickening crunch. He's pouring molten lead into the rubber housing, admiral. We're, we'll only go in circles. And look, sir, his squibs did some damage to our mainsail. Above them, the mother dog's once perfectly crisp main canvas was now tattered as widow's lace. Admiral, an officer ran across the deck, holding one of the liberated sea chests under his arm. They're all empty, sir. He's taken the treasure. I don't know how he did it. No one knows how the devil does his work, Admiral Bridgewater muttered. Only that he must be stopped. By now, the jewel was a fly on the horizon. The admiral could have wrung his own neck for failing to squash it when he had the chance. Chip the rudder free, came his order, short and clipped. Get my flagship back to port. Row it in if you have to. What about the pirates, sir? An officer dared to press. Admiral Bridgewater stared past the Miranda at the water. Merrick never keeps his head in the sand for too long. He's too brash. He'll poke out when he's bored, and we'll be ready for him. Okay, that's where we're stopping for today. I hope you guys are enjoying this book so far. Episodes will release every Wednesday and Sunday. So depending on what day this video comes out, you've just got a few more days to wait for the next one. In the meantime, keep reading with your reading buddy, keep working on those crafts and coloring pages, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!